Um, Jolly, um, as I said, you're uh, one of the most prominent figures, um, I personally think, in the field of impact investing uh, on a global level. And um, even though you earned your money in a completely different subject among other topics uh, that we were doing, but you were one of the uh, architects of the uh, OS X or OS X, uh, which is used literally on every Mac, iPad, iPhone, everything, um, even on my MacBook that I'm using at the moment, uh, right. by the way. Uh, and um, so you, your background is um, IT engineering, software development, and architecture, etc. So you have an IT management career at, in the Silicon Valley, and this was also financially uh, very successful for you. And you turned your attention now to a completely different topic, and that's um, yeah, namely supporting impact businesses, impactful business, social businesses, so to say. And how did you come to that? Well, great. Thank you, Rene, for the kind introduction and for being my partner in this exciting conversation. And many thanks for the organizers, particularly Ms. Sabine. What a great accomplishment to switch um, from an in-person event to an online event within just three weeks. And many thanks, of course, to all the participants online. I'm honored to be here and also very excited about our up upcoming conversation, Rene. So let me first briefly talk about my Silicon Valley career as that resulted uh, in the opportunity to become an impact investor. I do have a PhD in computer science from the Technische Universität Wien and immigrated to Silicon Valley in 1986. And after working for Hewlett Packard for a few years, I caught the startup bug, of course, and worked at three successful, very successful startups, usually as the senior technology executive responsible for product development and engineering with titles like uh, VP of Engineering or Chief Technology Officer. The first startup was a company called Next, and that company was um, founded by Steve Jobs after he was fired from Apple, and I was in charge of developing the operating system, which became Apple's main OS after Steve sold Next to Apple for about 400 million. The second startup that I was involved in was Datamind, an artificial intelligence company that was sold for 400 million to Epiphany in the late 90s. And my masterpiece in Silicon Valley was Ariba, a business-to-business e-commerce company, which we took public in 1999. That was one of the most successful IPOs at the time. Ariba was ultimately bought by SAP in 2012 for almost 5 billion euros. And between 1999 and the technology crash of 2001, I diversified my stock holdings, which created quite a bit of wealth. And that changed things for us. We had to ask the fundamental question of what is the meaning of wealth? After a significant liquidity event, uh, marriages often break apart, especially if one of the partners wants to do the Ferrari thing and the other one is into self-actualization, right? And my wife Lisa and I are very, very fortunate that we were both on the same page. The only possible answer for us to the question of the meaning of wealth has been to make a positive contribution to humanity and the planet. We believe in values like sustainability, regeneration, resilience, circularity, renewable energy, and peace, and could not possibly leave our values at the door when it comes to impact investing. We did have to fire a couple of advisors as they didn't really understand us or did not want to understand us, but ultimately we found the right team and have worked with them ever since. So the first motivation that you asked me about for moving into impact investing is our core belief that wealth comes with responsibility, with the responsibility of making a positive contribution. The second motivation has to do with the fact that we are both systemic thinkers. Systems do change under pressure and they don't change if there's not enough pressure. I believe that the current pandemic and climate change are caused by pressures on, on our system Earth, like our fossil fuel run economy and the massive inequality experienced in many societies all over the world. We are at the beginning of a massive global transformation where humanity will have to learn how to live within the caring constraints of a finitely resourced planet. And our systems, economic, System. The current old model of philanthropy does not have bigger systemic issues like social justice and inequality, and it will not address 
climate change in time to avoid major disruptions. As a matter of fact, it contributes to dependencies and corruption and is mostly a feel-good activity for the rich and the super rich. The classical investment model of maximizing the financial returns for the investors at all costs while pushing social and environmental costs to society at large is a deadly design flaw of the economic system. Our objective and strategy is to help change the economic and financial system such that positive social and environmental impact is at its core. Impact investing is one important opportunity to do that. And we'll talk about that later in our conversation. You know, I mentioned um, uh, Steve Jobs and I wish that he would still be around because uh, at this point in his life, he would probably challenge the status quo of investing and philanthropy. Bill Gates does it like he, he built his, um, his business. He copies what, think, what he thinks is great and scales it up. But if you copy the old way of philanthropy and scale it up, you actually create more issues than solutions. I hope that uh, Bill will copy what we do on impact investing like he did copy our technology and scale it up successfully to make the, the, the world a better place. Before we go on, to uh, talking about other topics, you mentioned social entrepreneurs. So just briefly why we latched on to social entrepreneurs. Uh, Lisa and I always had an affinity to entrepreneurs, of course, being, ones, being, being entrepreneurs ourselves, and social entrepreneurs are aligned with our values. And that's why we decided that part of changing the financial system is to develop the ecosystem for social entrepreneurs. We started out working with individual social entrepreneurs from all around the world, and then decided to help more entrepreneurs to go to scale by founding multiple business accelerators for these social entrepreneurs. This, the first one we did was in India very early on in 2004, and it's still very successfully run by our partner over there. The second one we co-founded, um, it's called Investment Ready Program in Vienna, Austria, in partnership with Erste Stiftung and the Viennese Impact Hub. It's also still running. And Lisa is leading one in Hawaii, where we are supporting many entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs who are working on making the island economy of Hawaii sustainable, resilient, circular, and regenerative. So that hopefully gives you a sense of why we have been doing that and why we decided to get into this field. Wow. <laughs> that was very, very int good introduction about how you came to impact investing and what, what, what the meaning behind it is. Uh, the funny side fact is um, that, uh, as you mentioned, Bill Gates, yeah, I was thinking exactly the same thing. So he tries to, <laughs> to, to serialize and copy uh, these, these behaviors of the markets uh, and, and to, let's say, do a machinery around uh, philanthropy and all, uh, all of this. Um, and I think it will not work out quite well. But no. anyhow, that's, that's another topic. But um, today we will hear a whole lot of keywords. And I think um, you got also an opinion about that. I mean, there is ESG investments. Then we have the SDGs. And we have a sustainable investing, responsible investing. We have impact investing. It's ex even for me, and I'm, I'm in that topic. I mean, you're much longer in that topic than I am, but basically for about five to six years now. And even for me, it's extremely confusing. What is your definition? How would you define in that, that, that area? How would you define impact investing? Well, the, yeah, it is confusing. And particularly over the last few years, you know, everybody jumped onto the impact bandwagon and frankly, Rene, there's a lot of uh, impact washing and greenwashing going on. So I've started to really, um, and I'm not the only one, it's an emergence happening right now of differentiating between what we call broad impact and deep impact. But let me just remind ourselves about the definition as you asked about impact investing. So looking back a little bit, the Rockefeller Foundation actually coined the term impact investing more than 10 years ago. And then the Global Impact Investing Network was founded a little over 10 years ago. The GIN, as it's called, uh, it represents institutional capital and their definition of impact is mostly accepted by all players. And um, in their definition, impact, is, in, impact investing comprises the following four characteristics. Number one, not in priority order, it's in we do it intentionally, right? Second, 
it's an investment approach, not an asset class. And I would talk about 100 percenters and uh, doing that across all asset classes if we have a chance to do that. And most deep impact investors are going in in all asset classes. Number three, it's not only about the financial return, but also about the social and environmental return. And number four, you need to measure that additional return, social and or environmental return. Now, when Lisa and I went on our journey for deep impact, um, we articulated our desire to go all in 100% for all of our investable assets in 2005, about 15 years ago. The following year, we developed our strategy to do that across all asset classes, which was quite innovative at the time. And it took us seven years to go all in across all asset classes. Now we documented these results, right? Because it was very important to, for us to influence others to maybe copy us and go all in and replicate what we have done. And in 2016, we documented our 10 year track record of a 100% aligned impact portfolio delivering what they call market rate returns as it is articulated by a blended industry benchmark across all asset classes. While going into deep impact with 50% of our portfolio. So that's audited and it's very, you know, all, you can read up on all the investments and you can check how, how that can be done. Then, you know, I talked about the incubators and accelerators that we, that we co-founded on the demand side of capital and the supply side of capital. 10 years ago, we co-founded Tonic, a global network of impact investors. And five years ago, we co-founded the 100% network, which is part of Tonic. And this is the evidence that I wanted to give the audience that this is not only us anymore, but it's, it's an emergence of a, I would say a small movement, particularly on the deep side, but a big movement on the broad side. So we're not, and, and, and that's great. And I'm sure that Christine Siegel, the uh, managing director of Tonic Europe, will talk a little bit more about Tonic in her remarks later this morning. So let me now talk about ESG broad impact and what I call deep impact. ESG stands for environmental, social and governance practice. In the last few years, it has become almost, almost mainstream and many big asset management companies have come out with tons of ESG products claiming impact. However, ESG is just good management practice, how to manage your company. It has nothing to do with impact, particularly deep impact. It makes sense to apply these criteria to your company, no matter if you're a weapons manufacturer, an oil producer, or a renewable energy company. If you have a well-diversified board, then that adds to your governance core. If you treat your workers right, then that adds to your social score. If you decide to invest in weapon manufacturers, you will probably get a better financial return if their ESG scores are high. But most impact investors would not want to knowingly invest in these types of companies. Even if all the money in the world would flow into ESG proper, inequality and injustice would still increase and we would not be able to mitigate climate change in time. Therefore, I call this type of investing broad impact. ESG is certainly better than non-ESG, but it will not solve the big systemic issues of our time. That's where deep impact comes in. So deep impact is different, and that's why we need to differentiate it. Deep impact deals with the major systemic issues of our times with an awareness and consciousness that is non-human centric, non-anthropocentric. It is in service to humanity and the planet. Let me make it more concrete, Renee, for a second and, 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 and explain three um, investments that Lisa and, and I did uh, over the last few years that show our approach to this deep impact space. The first one is called social impact bonds. We invested in the first social impact bond, which is the first financial instrument on the planet that explicitly ties the financial return to the impact that you have in, with a proven model. The deeper the impact, the more financial return we get, the less impact, the less return we get, as proven by a controlled study group. We invested in the first social impact bond in the UK. That was, its objective was to reduce recidivism. People who get released from prison, 40% of them go back to prison within a year. If we could lower that rate to half of that, then society would save a ton of money. And therefore, us impact investors, we finance an effort that, uh, that allows these, um, these released prisoners to get job training, to get housing, to get alcohol abuse training, whatever, right? In order not to go back to prison. And then, ever on how much um, impact we have. 
if that would go to scale, then we could even put an, an equity layer on top of that, right? And the, that equity would actually go up and down with impact. So that's, that's a dream that we have. You know, and it's still early days, but I think it's a very innovative product that would really change uh, how you can invest in these. We also invested in the, in the first social stock exchange, you know, um, that was also in the UK that worked on democratizing, you know, opportunities for the retail investor, which we care a lot about. Impact investing should not only be for the rich, it should be for anybody. That one was not successful financially, but it is being copied by other social stock exchanges around the world. And I hope that there's going to be many thriving soon. And the last one that I want to mention goes a little bit more into what I care about, and that's the confluence of impact, modern technology, and consciousness. And it's proof of impact, where we use modern technology like, like blockchain and artificial intelligence to actually prove that the impact is happening. So we put the impact events on a blockchain, and then you can actually finance these impact events. As an example, you know, proof of impact, we work with the Ethiopian government on lowering the mortality rate of um, expecting moms and their babies. And we know that if they go to, to the doctor and to the hospitals who are qualified to do their exam, that that will predictably lower the mortality rate. And so as soon as the mother shows up in, in a, a doctor's office or at a hospital that's qualified, we put that event on, an imp on, on a blockchain. And then the Dutch um, Development Bank pre-finances tens of thousands of these. And by pre-financing those events, they can predictably lower that, um, uh, that, that mortality rate. And I think that that modern technology you know, is, is the beginning of what, what I would call tokenization of impact, which is the follow-on model to venture capital and private equity in the context of impact, the impact economy. I'm very excited that that's going to happen in the next three to five years. Exactly. And by the way, we are also working on a kind of platform like that. So we should discuss that. The funny fact is that we <laughs> two, of, two of the largest, uh, by the way, uh, um, uh, impact uh, organizations or impact uh, investment organizations are called Gin and Tonic. Mm. Yes. Coincidence? Not, not, not coincidentally. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, very, very short question because we only have three minutes left. Um, um, probably um, if you, I just travel back in time. Just yeah. a year ago, um, I opened up the newspaper and uh, we read about Greta, we read about Fridays for Future, we read about literally every day we found an article about the climate change and everything. And if I open a newspaper today, I mean we have another topic, that's the corona crisis. And um, you barely read anything about probably it's, it's, there is a heat wave in Siberia and now, uh, let's say, the first uh, Fridays for Future demos are starting, etc. But that's basically side notes. And um, would you expect, I mean, it, it, is there enough money out there to finance all this after the corona crisis or is even the corona crisis probably one cornerstone that is pulling mm -hmm. impact investing towards a more positive and, and, and towards more traction? What do you think about that? Yeah, so I'm conscious of time. Thanks for reminding me. So let me wrap up within two minutes, uh, make sure that we get uh, things done. So in my opinion, COVID-19 is a consequence of the unsustainable path that we're on. It's a symptom of that path, not the root cause. It is showing us that we are in a multisystemic crisis, and it's just the first step in, in, in a fairly uncomfortable, you know, uh, things that are going to happen. Uh, we, we're now getting into into the global recession and then climate change is going to accelerate and if you're not careful and don't change things then ultimately we, uh, that will lead to biodiversity collapse which is going to um, mean a systemic breakdown on, on a global scale but we can do it differently and so we actually know what to do and let me end on that note because we in our lives and in, and in our businesses yeah, we need to adhere to um, fundamental principles like circularity regeneration resilience and regionality in the data-driven world of tomorrow, we need to build transparent and open data architectures using modern technology, like I just said, like artificial intelligence, blockchain, and the Internet of Things. On the investment and financial side, we need to move from so-called market rate returns to appropriate financial returns, introducing and accelerating new ideas like spending capital and what I mentioned, the pay-for-success models. And we need to enable everybody to meaningfully participate in this effort pushing for radical um, democratization of all processes. So we call this the impact economy. Let me end on, on the choices that we have. So you and I and all of us listening, we have a choice to make between three, three choices, I think. We will, uh, first, we might allow the system. I don't think that's a great, great choice. 
Number two is we will give up and witness the great unraveling. And that's not a great choice because then it's just going to go down, down south. But number three is what I hope that we will choose all of us and that we will be, that, that we will be the architects of the great transition towards a more just and sustainable world. The choice is ours. And I know that many in the audience uh, hopefully will make that choice or already have made that choice. So let's challenge the status quo and choose to be the disruptor of going back to business as usual. And I want to end with a quote from Steve Jobs, um, who said, um, we are here to put a dent in the universe. Otherwise, why else even be here? So um, <laughs> thanks, uh, Rene. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, thank you very much for that uh, uh, closing words. And it's always inspiring uh, to talk to you. Um, yes. uh, thank you very much that you took Thank you time. very much. From me too, Charlie. Best regards to Innsbruck and hope to see you soon. Okay. Hope to see you soon. Yes. And thanks all <laughs> for listening in. Yes. Okay. Charlie, thank, thank you very much. Bye.